Okay. So before we get underway, I'd like to acknowledge that the presenters of tonight's webinar are on the lands of the Darawal people, that's me. Nikki is uh, on the lands of the Ghana people, and Pam is on those of the Eora Nation. And we'd all like to pay our respects to their elders, past, present, and those emerging to carry on custodianship of this land. And we'd like to extend that respect to any Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people here with us tonight, or today, wherever you are. So the reason we're here is to talk about the new MyScope simulators. Now, uh, I'm Jenny Whiting, and I'll be giving a bit of an intro to MyScope and the simulators. Then uh, Nikki and Pam are going to give uh, live demos of uh, the simulators. Nikki is chair of our education committee and director of our University of South Australia facility. And Pam Young is a, um, a senior uh, optical microscopist at our University of Sydney facility and has been very instrumental, um, as has Nikki, in the development of these simulators. So first of all, just a little bit about Microscopy Australia for those who are not so aware. Uh, we're an Australia-wide network of university-based microscope facilities, and we're all connected um, in a collaborative structure that provides open access um, to these facilities for researchers uh, from any university or industry around the country, but also internationally through collaboration. So we are enabling research by providing this open access to a huge range of instruments and expertise. And we have quite a significant number of different um, technique platforms, hundreds of instruments and uh, very experienced um, expert staff. And we'd really like to acknowledge all those staff that have um, contributed so significantly to the development of MyScope. Uh, over the years. So as many of you will be well aware, modern microscopes are expensive and specialized um, and they're not something you can just sit down and use immediately. Um, and research is demanding extremely well-trained users that get supported by highly skilled staff. And to get them up to that level where they can actually use the instruments themselves, because that's what we encourage. We don't do the microscopy for our users. We train them to become microscopists themselves and that way they can really get the most out of the instruments that we make available. So back in 2010, uh, Microscopy Australia experts came together to develop MyScope to train new microscopists and help researchers to become microscopists. And really it's part of this online learning environment is part of a blended training approach that um, aims to improve training efficiency in our facilities and save time for our, um, our staff who can then uh, also help uh, more experienced users in really getting the most out of the instruments and with interpretation of results. So that's sort of what's um, behind my scope uh, and the reasons we came to do it. It also, it provides um, a way to um, help manage diversity because learners' backgrounds when they come for training are hugely diverse. They may have never encountered a microscope before. They may be expert in one, one area, but need training on another. Um, they may have English as their first language or not. Um, and the fact that we've got this online tool really helps learners to progress at their own pace. Um, it's the online format can really help overcome cultural and language barriers. People can go back um, over it many times or as fast or as slowly as they like. And it's um, really suitable for everyone from undergraduates, postgraduates, researchers, core facility staff, managers who want to get a bit of an idea about what goes on in the facilities right through to industry users. Um, and even though it was developed to train our new users, of which we have a couple of thousand each year, it's really been taken up um, as the premier microscopy training tool around the world. And I just thought I'd 
put this uh, nice quote up here from Christian Fellhaus from the Max Planck Institute for Developmental Biology in Tübingen in Germany, who um, obviously was very enthusiastic and, and grateful for what we've provided. So uh, thank you to Christian, but we do have other, um, this kind of feedback does come from all around the world and we have you know, well over 100,000 uh, users each year using MyScope. So this is what the front page of MyScope looks like. Um, and I want to uh, emphasize here, it is free and openly accessible. Uh, it's available at this URL. And just again, it's free and it's openly accessible. So the demonstrations that you see tonight, the, the um, presenters are just accessing the website, just going online and using the website as it is, as you can at any time. So the structure of MyScope um, is set out um, in these tabs along the top here. Uh, theory, uh, tab has, as it sounds, the theory about the technique um, that we're studying. Practical has access to a simulator that I'll come back to. Then there's tabs for assessments, glossary and explore. Now I gave an introduction to MyScope um, last year and that's available as a video uh, on our YouTube channel. It's Microscopy Australia YouTube channel. Um, so if you'd like to know more about how to use um, the full range of features of MyScope, I strongly advise you to go and have a look at that webinar. However, it's the instrument simulators that we're really here to discuss tonight. Um, and it's these simulators that are really at the heart of my scope. What we try to do here is to give learners a realistic uh, experience of operating um, an instrument, but we want to make sure that they're brand agnostic. We don't want to be it's not like a flight simulator where you have to know exactly which knob to twiddle in this exact plane. We're trying to teach concepts uh, here. Uh, and so we have a very generic interface that's um, simple and clear and really focuses the, the user's mind on what they're um, trying to achieve uh, as they progress through the guided steps. Now, Back in 2010, when um, MyScope was first created, it was, uh, these simulators were created in Flash. Now, as you're probably aware, Flash is no longer supported. And with the end of Flash, that has driven us to uh, revamp our simulators uh, and bring them um, more up to date in terms of code, making them, uh, we've also taken the opportunity, obviously, to revise and review and improve uh, the simulators. So very happy to announce tonight that the conversion from Flash is now complete and all the simulators are now fully functional. Uh, so the ones that we've just made live, uh, the light and fluorescence uh, module, uh, including the bright field fluorescence and now the confocal, the Brightfield and Fluorescence were live earlier in the year, but the Confocal has just recently been um, added and is a really lovely interface that Pam will take you through a bit later. TEM, uh, this also has been a bit of a long time coming, but um, it is now, <laughs> it is now up operational and uh, as is the XRD revamp. So we're going to take you through uh, these tonight or today, wherever you are. So this is the current 11 modules that we have uh, in MyScope. Uh, most of them have simulators, apart from the basics, the work health and safety and the research data management. Um, and these are the new ones that we're gonna be talking about tonight. Even though uh, this, uh, is a step that we've completed all this revamp of these existing simulators. This is not uh, the end of MyScope development. Um, coming soon, there'll be a super resolution part of the light and fluorescence simulator. And cryotechniques uh, is gonna be a new module with interactives, not actually a simulator, but with interactive elements. 
um, that will also be added in the near future. And at this time, I'll just revisit back over here to the research data management has also just gone live um, and is definitely well worth checking out um, as this is becoming such an important part um, of um, microscopy data and you know, managing uh, one's research. So this is just a um, quick um, thing on the TEM interface. Uh, we have chosen several different samples from a biological one, a minerals one, nanoparticles and an alloy, um, and where appropriate different operational pathways of selected um, uh, yeah, pathways of adjustments have been um, chosen to, in keep, to be in keeping with the type of sample um, that you've selected. And this simulator demonstrates imaging, diffraction, high-res TEM, and STEM. And here are some grabs from some of those um, areas. Um, and you'll see that there's some bits show um, the sample as shown on the phosphor screen, other ones you can see in the black and white as how it looks down the camera. And again, some uh, operations are um, tackled through the uh, interface with the buttons and other, other things that you do on the column itself are actually done on the column diagram. Uh, this is the XRD simulator interface, uh, which is a much simpler thing, but has many different samples that really uh, show you um, the different ways uh, that um, you can get good information from those. And the light and fluorescence uh, microscope interface comes in two parts for the uh, the bright field and the wide field fluorescence parts of the um, simulator it simulates how it is when you look down the microscope eyepieces and then when you move on to uh, the confocal part it switches to a much more um, computer based interface just as it would when you're on the real microscope so now I'm going to stop sharing my screen and we're first going to then transfer over to uh, Nikki Stanford, who's going to do a live demo of the TEM and XRD simulators. So I'm going to stop sharing my screen and ask Nikki if she'll share hers. Thanks, Jenny. Thanks for the intro. And hopefully now, um, maybe Jenny can give me a thumbs up if we can see the screen okay. Perfect, thanks. Um, yeah, so I'm just gonna um, take you through a quick demo of the um, TEM simulator. Um, and we actually um, deliberately made some sections actually quite hard. And I'll admit that there are some points at which I'm nervous and I may have a backup that I realize now are covered by the Zoom window. So let's just go for it and see how we go. So this is the interface. Um, and so on the left, we have what the buttons you would have on a normal TEM. Um, but we've also got this diagram here that has the physical column. And so that will show you the beam pathway as an educational tool. It'll also show you physically where the apertures are, for example, above the specimen or below the specimen. Um, and the reason we chose to do this is this is all about training a new person. Uh, new people that are using TEM for the first time are not using a $12 million aberration corrected instrument. They're using one of your workhorse uh, basic instruments. And those still have all of these uh, physical alignments and apertures um, are physically done on the column. So we're simulating that here by having this separate diagram. So let's just go ahead. Um, we start off here by removing the specimen. Um, and we need to decide what we're going to do. And I think we might do a zebrafish because we'll do this, the crystalline specimens a bit later. We insert the specimen. And as it's evacuating, we have this sort of like blue square that sort of faded away to represent the air being sucked out of the column. Um, now I've forgotten what I was doing. <laughs> so when um, you get the instruction here to tell you what to do, um, and when you've got something, a button to press, because there are so many on this particular simulator, we have this highlighting so people know what to do or where to look. Um, and here we have, again, you can only choose 120 for the zebrafish kilovolts. Um, and you have a little training um, note up the top telling you that we don't want to damage the sample. So we're always trying to give these little bits, bits and pieces to um, train people about what you're doing and why you're doing it. Um, 
So as soon as we turn the beam on, we see the, the light pathway um, or the, the electron pathway rather, um, and you can close that diagram and open it up whenever you like. Um, so this is the first point I'm nervous. Now we have to align the beam on the center and I may have written down how many clicks it is. <laughs> Thankfully, we're there. It won't let you go forward until you've perfectly aligned um, to the center of the column. So all of these steps really reinforce for the user that when you go to the next step, the next aperture, it's never in the center. And your main goal of all alignments is to center everything down through the column. So now we need to um, just expand the beam. And I really like this feature. It goes in and out just like a normal TEM, which I think is fantastic. Um, and I think you'd all agree of the TEM uses, the green is absolutely perfect. It looks exactly like a TEM phosphor screen. So now we're going to um, add an aperture. Of course, we always align the TEM from the top down. So we put in the um, condenser aperture. Automatically, this will pop up and show you that you need to insert it physically here. And so we can close that now. We need to choose an aperture size. And then, oh, here's another nervous point for me. Now we've got to align it and it's not circular because it's got a stigmation, but here we go. Lucky. Um, so again, uh, all microscopy, we need to correct for stigmation. Um, so, oh, wrong way. Again, uh, we've got that simulated here. Um, <clears throat> Now we need to diverge the beam again. So now for the um, aperture alignment, we go to diffraction mode. Because this is a zebrafish, it's effect effectively an amorphous specimen. You see just this sort of amorphous ring. But if you were to put in the aluminium spe specimen, you would see the actual um, spots from, uh, from the crystalline features. Uh, so this is the kind of detail we tried to go to um, because it's important for a training tool about what we see and why we see it. Again, to insert um, the objective aperture, we can see where it is, it's highlighted and we have to insert it physically on the column. Luckily, this one's an easy one to align. I didn't have to count it. Uh, and if we go back to imaging mode, <clears throat> we get a first look at our specimen and a dog barking in the background. I apologize for that. Um, and the next thing we do with any TEM specimen is we um, adjust the eccentric height. Um, so we've got a wobbler. It doesn't come across great in Zoom. Uh, but actually, in real life, it looks genuinely like you're looking at a wobbler in a TEM. It's fantastic. Andres did a great job of coding that for us. So we've got ourselves to the eccentric height. The user can now effectively look around at this specimen like they would. Um, but as a training tool, um, we've given them a region of interest to aim for. So we'll just um, move the specimen um, up to that point. Um, and now we can uh, go to other magnifications, which is great. And what I might do now is I'll just quickly show you. Um, we've also got some nanoparticles that would look like this. Um, and we've also got this um, aluminium specimen with precipitates in it, which you can also do um, nice imaging on. So I might just jump forward to some of the other um, features we have. Um, so this is um, diffraction mode. So we um, even went to the, the effort of um, showing convergent beam tilting of the specimen. Um, it's quite quick to do. So you can see we've got um, a Kikuchi pattern. Um, we've got alignment with um, a tilt down here. And when we go back to imaging, open up the beam. <clears throat> Again, it shows us that we need to insert an aperture. Choose which aperture you want, aperture you want, insert it. Or oh, we've got to center it, of course, or we've got to center your aperture. And now we go to diffraction mode. And so some one of the big training uh, tools that we need to impart on people is not to damage the phosphor screen, or the, sorry, the digital camera. And so uh, one of the really critical things in diffraction is to make sure you don't um, uh, overexpose it in this central spot. And so um, in this simulation, you have to insert the beams, the beam stop. It comes into the actual image as well as um, into the pathway on the microscope. 
Um, and then you the point um, of inserting the camera and acquiring the image. Hopefully this will, oh, I don't know. Whoa! It's all right, I've got another one I've prepared earlier. Um, so I might, in the interest of time, I actually might skip forward to, um, this is one of my favourites. Um, so we've also got high resolution imaging where we've taken a video of somebody using um, FFT to um, correct stigmation. So that's a really great tr training tool again to show people what you need to do. And we also looked at STEM mode. Um, and so um, we even went to the effort of um, getting these ronchigrams and you can actually grab the objective lens focus and go through the whole ronchigram um, focal point through this is just an amorphous carbon uh, sample. Um, and so that's again, a nice training tool because the first thing any user will say to you is what's a ronchigram? Well, if they've already done this, they'll know what it is, they'll know what it looks like and they know what they're aiming at. Um, but I've prepared one on the exact focal point because that's also one to get difficult to get just right. Um, and so again, so this is a video we took of um, using the raunchy gram um, to correct the stigmation. Um, and so this is a video that runs when the, the user clicks on that um, to show them what it looks like, um, because it was one of those things that was uh, difficult to code for the user, but important to visualize. So that, that video takes about 30 seconds um, to show um, stigmation correction. Then we can go on to our next thing, which is projector lens alignment. So we again, center the raunchy gram. Oh no, now I can't. Oh no, now I've come unstuck, haven't I? <laughs> oh, damn. Didn't think that one. Oh, there we go, got it. <sighs> and now we need to insert the condenser aperture. You can see the beam path is different now because we're in STEM mode. So we took a lot of effort to get these details right as a training tool. Um, we need to obviously center that aperture. Insert a detector determine its bright field. And we raster it like an SEM and that's our um, STEM image. So that's kind of, I guess, uh, an overview of um, the TM simulator. If you had a user um, that wanted to go through it, I would say it would probably take them more than half an hour. If they struggled on the aperture alignments like I do every time, maybe a bit longer, um, but you can also go back um, you see we've got this button down the bottom to restart your section and people might want to go back and do it with uh, different specimens. They might want to do the zebra fish and then the nanoparticles, for example. So the next thing, I've just got a few minutes left for my section. So what I might do is just go on to the XRD simulator. <clears throat> like Jenny said, this is really simple. Um, but uh, the best thing about it is um, we've got real data. It's not simulated data. And so all of these, there's about, I think, 20 or so, maybe even 30, um, of a real diverse range of specimens that might be really interesting for, for a user to look at. So we might just, let's choose something, aluminium. So again, as training tools, uh, we've shown that you obviously will have these illuminated on a real instrument. Um, and we've got the instrument sort of visualized in cartoon format here x-ray source on the left hand side and the detector on the right. So you have to open the doors, your specimen shoots in, have to close your doors. Then we have to turn on the x-ray tube. And those of you who are really pernickety about your tubes like me, you note that the kilovolts go up first and then the milliamps, very important. Then we choose our start and end angles. I'm happy with those. Then your step size and your scan rate. It lets you know how many seconds it would be in real life. It's obviously very much accelerated in the simulator. And we start the scan. The shutter's open, it's red. And when this is in motion, it's also got a red spot on the X-ray source, just like in real life. And then this is our scan. Um, just like when you're normally using an X-ray machine, if you wanna change your sample, you don't have to do much. You just have to open the doors and put one in. So we can just go and grab something silicon powder, open the doors, close them again. We already turned on the tube when we started. So that simply stays on just like in real life. And then we simply scan again, whatever we'd like to do. <clears throat> and because this is real data, you can actually zoom in uh, as a training tool to certain um, 
to certain angles. So I think on silicon, if we go 45 to 50, start scan. You can actually see the KR for one, KR for two and the shoulder between them because it was, you know, uh, taken on a real instrument. So again, as a training tool, there's some nice, nice features about this simulator. Um, so I think that's probably all from me. So I might throw back to Jenny and stop sharing my screen. Well, wonderful. Thanks, Nikki. That was really great. Um, so I think we're going to save up questions till the end, but there will be plenty of time for you to ask questions. So let's move straight over to Pam and I'll ask her to share her screen and uh, take it away for light and fluorescence. Thanks, Jenny. Can you hear me? Yes. And can you see my screen? Let's move it a bit because I've got Zoom now on top of it. Oh no, I moved it. The whole thing went terrible. There we go. Now it's back. Um, can you see the simulator? Yes. Um, so um, many of you might already be familiar with the bright field and the fluorescence simulator because um, they've been available for a while. Uh, so I just sort of wanted to bring up the um, uh, what you are probably used to seeing, and then you'll see that it changes when I click on to go to confocal. So you can see now we've got the separate channels like you would on a, a confocal microscope. You can also see we've got an activities menu here, and so it goes through um, a few different um, activities that are things that you would probably have to think about when you're doing actual um, scanning with the confocal microscope, which is fantastic. Um, obviously, the first thing for any sample would be to visualize the sample. So I'm just going to go ahead and click here to start. And that's just going to start on that very first um, activity. And it's just going to step you through them. But you can click on this activities menu at any point and, and click ahead or click behind if there's something you want to do again or um, if you've already done it all once and you really want to come back and, and revisit one of these, you know, in a future, a future visit. Uh, you can also click on the light path if you'd like, and it shows you the light path of the microscope, which is nice. Um, so the first thing we want to do is choose channel three. It gives us instructions. Um, and then we're going to need to uh, put a little bit of power on the detector because obviously if there's no, no voltage on your detector, you're not going to see much. So I'm going to uh, bring it up to whatever it tells me. It says 40, so I'll take it up to 40. because Just like in the modules Nikki was showing you, if you don't do it right, it won't let you move on to the next step. Um, uh, and so then uh, we sort of choose a starting point for our laser, which um, because this is um, a, you know, a generic confocal, we're choosing a 5% laser power. People who've worked on confocal microscopes know that on some systems, 5% laser is crazy high and you never use that. And on other systems, 5% is crazy low and you've never used that. So um, we chose that sort of um, arbitrarily because again, just needs to, um, be consistent for the simulator. Um, and then we set our pinhole to uh, one area unit because that's sort of the ideal optimal confocal pinhole size. Although um, when you do the pinhole exercise, you get to see why that is the ideal optimal pinhole size. Um, and then the image size is set at this stage. To, uh, we'd like to do 512 by 512 because it gives you kind of a fast scan and that's where I typically start, I think where most people typically start when they're scanning with a confocal microscope, because um, it gives you, you know, about a frame a second. Um, so you're able to get sort of um, a real time interaction to focus on your sample and um, to move around and find areas of interest. Um, then we can click live view. And so you can see something appears. Um, now from the um, under over table, we might want to change our lookup table to um, a high low or under over LUT. Um, because this is just uh, grayscale data, it's just a you know, monochrome detector, you can kind of make it whatever color you want. And we find that this LUT is really, really useful um, when you're trying to optimize your settings because it makes all of the, the zero grayscale values um, cyan and it makes all of your saturated pixels, um, in the case of an 8-bit detector, 255, 12-bit, 4095, et cetera, et cetera, uh, it makes those red. 
Now, this is also different from brand to brand. Um, so some systems use green for their zeros and blue for their saturated. Some use blue for their zeros and um, magenta for their saturated. So again, we just sort of picked something and went with it that's consistent for the simulator. Um, so uh, now that we've got our screen, you can see it's nicely scanning away. I wouldn't be talking and scanning at the same time in the real world. I'd be photo bleaching my samples, but at the moment we're safe because it's a simulator. Um, so then we just follow along with the next thing we want to do. I like to start by adjusting my gain to find kind of an optimal um, brightness where I'm not saturating the detector, but where I've got a, not, a lot of nice signal. So I usually like to bring that up first. You can see you can scan it up and down. And, and, and of course, if you drop the detector too low, you can't see anything. So those are all zeros. Um, and so you've got to find that that optimal setting. So you can see I've got a couple of saturated pixels, but not many. And that's what we're really looking for in the real world. And it tells you that, explains that to you as well in the text. Um, and then the next thing you want to do is maybe adjust that laser power a little bit. Um, uh, the big difference, and I always have to explain this in my training between gain and laser power, is if you turn that gain up really high, your image will get noisy. But if you turn that laser up really high, you're going to you know, photo bleach or possibly even burn up your sample. So that's why I kind of like to start with gain and watch where that noise starts to become a problem because I can always tweak. This is really a very iterative process when you're actually on the microscope, but in the simulator, we just step them through one at a time. So we can bring this up and down. You can again, you can see as I bring up the laser, it gets very, very bright. As I bring down the laser, it gets very, very dim. And eventually, if you turn off the laser, obviously you don't see anything. Um, and again, if you don't find that sweet spot, uh, it won't let you progress. So there, we found our sweet spot. And then the last thing we want to adjust is the offset, and that's those um, that black level, uh, those zeros in the detector. So again, if you bring it up too high, your image starts to get very um, sort of gray and, uh, and gross. And if you bring it down too low, you've got a lot of, um, of zeros and you start to lose that dim information. So you've got to find that, that nice sweet spot, which is probably around there. Um, and then we can go back to our, our default LUT. So um, something I found when I train users is uh, if, if they think the floor four they put in is red, they want to visualize it on the screen red, even though we're actually capturing in grayscale. So um, even I could color it whatever I wanted, but red, red for a, a 560, uh, 560, Alexa 568. Uh, and so then when you're done, you click live view to stop scanning. And then we probably want to take it up to a higher pixel resolution before we capture. Um, and so, uh, then we can click capture image and of course it will scan slower because it's scanning four times as many pixels, right? And it, the simulator shows you that. So you can actually experience that now in the interest of time. Um, I'm not going to go through every single one of the activities. I'm going to skip ahead. Um, I think uh, a couple of really interesting ones at the end here are the multi-channel images. And um, maybe if there's time, I'll do 3D Z stacks. If not, I will leave that for you to do on your own. But I think it's really great that um, you know this first image was done with a 10x objective, but then we can move up to a 40x with a higher NA. And so you can see that improvement in resolution. Um, when you go up to that higher NA lens. Uh, the pinhole, I think, is really, really important. Obviously, that's the whole point of using the confocal microscope is to block that out of focus um, fluorescence. And so you can see what happens if you close that pinhole down too much or if you open it up too much, how your sample gets really, really bright and kind of blurry from all that out of focus fluorescence coming in. And so you can see all that because we captured all of these images for the simulator. Um, pixel dwell time is great because you also get to see how it scans slower if you do um, a longer pixel dwell time, spend more time capturing from each pixel, right? Um, but obviously the benefit of slowing that down is you get a less noisy image, you get more signal, right? So these are all things that you have to think about when you're actually setting up your scan. Um, pixel arrays, so what your actual pixel size is. Um, we talk about that, especially in the theory, because um, you know, you only have so much resolution out of your objective and that's dependent on that numerical aperture. Um, so you want to choose the appropriate pixel size, pixel array to get good sampling, but not to capture more than you're actually getting out of your objective. So we get to go through pixel arrays um, and now I'm going to skip ahead to the multi-channel images. So you can see now the image has changed because I'm now, we switched to the 40X during the objective exercise. So if you're doing them in order, this would all make sense. But since I'm skipping around, we've just, we skip to the 40x. Um, so then 
it tells me to start off by going back down to 512 by 512 because I want to do a, a fast scan again. Um, and then we can go through um, simultaneous scan mode, which is really nice here. Um, and so simultaneous scan modes means that we're going to be shining multiple lasers on the sample at the same time. Um, that's a, a good time saving technique if you aren't super, super concerned about crosstalk or spectral bleed through. Um, if you are concerned about those things, it's going to be really important that you scan sequentially. And we talk about that. That's what we're going to go through now. So uh, go to live view. Live view button to stop scanning. Activate channel four. So this is going to be our far red channel. Um, you, your eyes can't really see far red. We really went back and forth on what color to make this far red channel because the overlay looked nicest in green, red, blue. We made far red blue. Again, it's a grayscale detector, so we can make it whatever color we want. There was discussion around using magenta or grayscale or something, but we settled on blue. Um, and again, because we go through optimizing gain, offset, laser power, and everything in that first exercise, we tell you here, hey, we already did that for the um, channel four. So let's just keep moving. Uh, so we're going to go live view again. I can move this around so I can see my channel three and my channel four. Then stop scanning, capture my two images. And what you can see here is that there's a lot of purple in that image. And that's because since I was shining the two lasers at the same time, I'm getting a lot of um, crosstalk. And it actually even downloads the image for you, which is nice. That's fine. I'll allow that. Um, so you can see that there's um, a lot of a lot of crosstalk there. Now it says save it so you can compare it to the sequentially acquired image. So I'll just get rid of that for the moment. So now to reduce the effects of spectral crosstalk, I'm going to do it sequentially, so one laser at a time. I've already optimized those channels, which is great. So I'm just going to click capture, and so you can see it scans with the first laser, and then it scans with the second laser, and then you can see your overlay, and there is a lot less purple. So you can see now your blue and your red are a lot more spectrally separated, which is great. Um, and of course, you've saved all of those images below because it lets you save all those so you can see those and compare them. Uh, and you can even click the compare button and it even shows you them right next to each other. So you can see lots of purple, not very much purple. Um, Da, 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 da. And then um, we can go ahead and turn on channel two. And so you can capture your nice three color image. So again, we've already optimized everything because we practiced that in the first one. Uh, so you can see we've got our green image, our red image, our blue image, um, and it's scanning them one at a time because I still have that sequential selected. So now I'll stop my live view and I'll do my three color. We had to do this channel four as a, a floating window. Um, typically in different, it's, it's done differently in different, um, for different microscope brands. Um, sometimes you just see the overlay. Sometimes you can split it out into three or four windows. Um, in this case, we did it this way and you can just sort of move that wherever it's convenient. So now I can click a quick capture. And you can see it's it's downloading each of those nice images for me. And then I can click here to see my pretty overlay. And ooh, ah, it's very pretty eye candy. Um, and it talks a little bit how it's each done sequentially. Um, and says, congratulations, I've completed this. I can continue to 3D. And now I'm going to ask Jenny, do you want me to do 3D or do you want me to skip to questions, Jenny? Oh, you're muted, hun. You're still muted, Jenny. Sorry about that. Uh, yes, you've got four minutes. So why don't you get started on the 3D? Okay. And the, if I don't get through it and we need to get to questions, just stop yeah. me, just wave no at me. No worries. Okay. Great. Um, congratulations, continue to 3D Z stacks. So I will select that here. Um, so I can deactivate my channel two and my channel four. Um, and then I can go to live view. And again, set stacking is, you know, these are the reasons you're doing confocal microscopy, right? Because you've got multiple floor fours that you want to look at because you've got um, uh, this optical section and capability. So that's why I really wanted to focus on those in this um, simulator. So we need to define our lower limit and upper limit of our Z stacks. So you can see that you can scroll through uh, the image here, just like you're focusing up and down on the microscope. So 
Um, I'm going to put my bottom, let's say right here, there's my bottom Z. And then I'm going to set my top focal plane. So come up through the cover slip. So you can see there's my top. Oh, I overshot it a hair. My apologies. Top Z. And then I want to choose a step size from the drop down. I'm going to choose the optimal. It gives you all sorts of lovely math if you're interested in that about how it's calculated. Um, then we can click the live view to stop scanning and we can capture our Z stack. And so this takes a really long time. We've actually sped it up three times what we've been doing for our 512 by 512 scan rate up to this point. Um, but you can see there that it's 126 micron range. Um, and if you'd looked at the math, we're doing like a 0.62 micron step or something like that. So it's gonna capture um, over 200 images right now. And you can see it slowly, slowly, slowly stepping its way through. So once it finishes, then um, uh, you know, you'll have that nice 3D image that you can rotate. Um, and then we'll go through and we'll do it again with a, a much bigger step, a five micron step instead of the 0.6 micron step. Um, and uh, then we can do that with the three color image and it still takes a long time because it's doing those three uh, sequential channels. But if we were to do all 200 slices, you'd be sitting here all day watching the acquired data, which is very true to real life. But for the sake of the simulator, we're taking pity on people. And it looks like it's just about through. Oh, and I've still got a whole minute. Look at me go. It's got to be close. It's gone black. No, oh, I can see they're still right in the bottom corner. We're almost there. Yay. And so now we've got this really nice 3D uh, maximum projection image that we can rotate that you can see going through that 126 micron thick stack of this tissue, um, which is great. Uh, and then the next thing we want to do is again, um, switch it to the five micron step size. Of course, captures that stack and that's obviously going to be significantly faster because it's only something like 30 slices. There we go. And now when you rotate through here, what you're going to see is obviously that missing data. So if you come on the side here, you can see all of that missing data that we didn't bother to capture. Um, so that kind of shows you the benefit of doing um, the proper sampling using the optimal step size. Um, obviously, it takes much longer, but those are the trade-offs. And then the last step is we're going to activate our other colors. Move channel four out of the way, capture Z stack. Uh, and again, it's going to do the channels one at a time, but we're still at the five micron step. So it's just going to be about 90 images or so, um, 30 for each color. And then we'll have a nice three color that we can rotate at the end. And that's voila. Oh, and we're already on the channel four. Look how quick it is. That is something I have to explain to all of my users at training is fair warning, your Z stacks might take 10 minutes. <laughs> and here we go. You can see we've got our nice three color rotate. Again, the missing data, but that's okay. It still looks really pretty. Wonderful. That's all I've got. Thanks, Jenny. Oh, no, thank you. That was wonderful. I think that's really given a nice uh, overview of what um, the simulators are capable of. Um, so now we'd like to open it up for questions. Ideally, if you could type them into the chat um, initially, and we'll work our way through those and uh, see, see how we go. I'll, I'll see what we've, we've got as we go along. And uh, while we're um, uh, just um, waiting for some questions to come in through the chat, I think um, as Pam was saying with that, um, with the simulator, with the timing, we tried to kind of get a nice balance between giving them the idea that it does take a while 
um, while not making it, it too long. So we try to do this um, with the simulators to try and um, get a good idea of what's going to be time consuming, what's going to be difficult, what's going to be um, the easier activities. So um, uh, we just uh, please do ask whatever questions you want. Um, and uh, we'll do our very best to answer them. So the, um, as I said earlier, the, um, it's a live and free uh, site. So you can just go on straight on and dive straight into the simulators and have a nice play. Um, so uh, that's, that's that. I think we're gonna unmute and quickly chime in. Yeah. Don't just dive into the simulators, read the theory first, please. Yes, absolutely. Now, then, that, that is very important. That is um, the idea. They they are designed to work together um, to um, yeah to really give a good overview both of the background that you need to know and the um, practicalities of actually getting those hands on. Um, so. Do you want to comment on the flipped classroom use of this platform? Um, Lisa, do you want to expand on what you mean by that? Sure, I guess it was more just that people have sort of um, reported using this as actually in a teaching in a classroom type environment um, and getting people to actually to go through it um, in a kind of, you know, to really build the foundations of the theory. And so I guess I just thought some people might not think of using it in in that manner in kind of more of a classroom mm -hmm. undergraduate or, or PhD, you know, cohort that might be um, coming on board, but just the fact that it is quite adaptable and it does have um, the assessments and that that are there as, as quizzes, as well as it can be, you know, added to other facilities that have perhaps their own kind of license or certificate mm -hmm. processes that can comp be complementary to, to this platform. Absolutely. And I think that is something that we expand a lot um, in the um, my earlier talk that's that's online. But yes, and from that quote from um, Christian, I think it is quite widely used around the world in classroom situations um, for undergraduates where they could they can have 100 people all in a room all doing um, my scope simulators, which is, is fantastic. And they uh, are really very much appreciated. I am one of those people who have used it during undergrad teaching to teach undergrads. Yeah, no, that's great. Um, okay, so we have a question here. What types of samples are available for the light and fluorescence microscopy simulator? Uh, apologies if I missed it. Are there a range of cell types? Um, there, I, I can answer that one at the moment. There are not uh, at this um, on this particular simulator because the reason um, that we don't routinely have a lot of different samples, um, especially on a more complex simulator like this, where hundreds and hundreds of images and image series had to be uh, collected to build the simulator, um, we didn't really feel that um, it was, uh, you gained much by having a lot of additional samples when it's really the concepts of the you know multiple fluorophores, the concept of the pinhole, the um, pixel size, and things like that could really be um, demonstrated on on one type of stain sample. So, um, in some of the um, ones like the XRD, for instance, um, that was a much easier kind of data collection to um, to gather, and that um, was an additional um, learning feature there. And for the TEM we just had the four different types um, because they had kind of slightly different features and particularly obviously between the biological and the more uh, robust um, physical science samples, um, there were different um, orders of adjustments to be made. So that was actually a learning benefit in that case. Um, but it, it does always depend a bit on the nature of the simulator versus the effort that needs to go into capturing the um, the information that um, that you see. So the confocal one, as you can imagine, was quite
quite substantial. <laughs> and uh, yeah, so it was, um, you know, we really appreciate all the hard work that particularly Pam put into making all that work seamlessly, which is wonderful. Thank you. The Z stack was impressive. It was nice to see that, the run through of that. Yeah, I think that's that's pretty, that's pretty good. Um, okay. Uh, no, there's no silly questions here. Um, can you use powder as well as pieces of concrete samples? Um, I'm not quite sure. Oh, hang on. Uh, Yes, pieces of concrete samples. Um, I'm not quite sure what um, you're getting at there, Weena, but it's certainly not a silly question. Um, but I think that sounds like it might be an XRD question, uh, Nikki. Yeah, yeah. yeah I'll jump in. Yeah. If it's Sorry. XRD, absolutely, powders, concrete, anything you can get in. Um, uh, TEM, uh, no. <laughs> no for concrete samples in the TEM without special, I guess, special expertise in that area. And if it was for light, yes, I've imaged light on the, con or I've imaged powder on the con Um Okay, so there's a question here. Uh, what's the preferred or recommended web browser for this? In the past, they've had problems with Internet Explorer, but it's always good on Firefox. Um, yes, Internet Explorer can be a bit problematic. Uh, occasionally, certainly Firefox, Chrome, Safari should all be fine. I'm not quite sure if our developer, Andres, is here. Uh, if he is, uh, he might like to comment on that. I'm just seeing if I can see. No, I don't think he's, I don't think he's with us. Okay, that's it. I know he was hoping to join us, but it wasn't necessarily going to be able to. Um, so, yes, he, he certainly... Um, aims to um, make it compatible with all the current major browsers, um, but it is really, it's, yes, it does get to be a bit of a how long is a piece of string these days to a certain extent. But if you do have problems with any particular browsers, obviously try another one if you can, but if you could let us know as well if you're having problems, then we can look at trying to uh, deal with that where we can. We, we also test it on mobile phones. So if any of your students want to look at the content in particular sitting on the bus, they can certainly do that. And in fact, it's sized specifically for use on mobile phones. However, having tried it, don't try and do the TEM simulator on the phone because your fingers won't be small enough. <laughs> yeah, I mean, we do, um, I think generally when something goes to a phone, the simulators on the phone, um, it generally says, um, it's better if you just go to a larger screen. Yeah, that's right. See the simulator, but certainly the theory part and the assessments and things can all be dealt with. Um, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, that's fine. And the assessments are also free. So those, those of you that are trainers, um, it's really becoming quite common uh, for trainers to send their students to do the content and sit the, um, the assessment on MyScope and then send their certificate of completion of that quiz and passing it as, as proof that they've um, learned information. So that's another tool that's free for you to use if you want to. Um, okay, there's another question that I'm going to direct to Nikki. Does my scope training module include related sample preparation and some basic data analysis, for example, TEM diffraction pattern indexing? No. Um, the modules um, give brief overviews of TEM sample prep but it is such an exhaustive um, topic. We've just given um, some flow charts of, you know, is your specimen a hard specimen? Is it a softer biological specimen? And a bit of a flow chart about what we recommend, uh, but it's really a very specific topic. So other than those sort of general recommendations, um, we don't have much. And what was the other part of the question? Sorry, it was like sample prep and- And uh, um, basic data analysis, e.g. diffraction pattern indexing. So we do, we show the physics of the diffraction and, and how you align the microscope to get diffraction, but we don't go into the indexing side of it. So we probably don't go to that level. Um, again, it's, it's, I guess it's a bit more of a specific uh, technique. It's the same with some of the other things um, like, um, can I think of uh, like EDS and that kind of thing. We show the theory about how we um, get x-rays, et cetera, um, and show some examples, but don't go too much deeper than that. Yeah, and I think 
the thing to bear in mind as well here is that we do um, see this as part of the blended learning approach. So when people are actually learning to do it on the real microscope with an expert trainer, um, those are those kind of that more advanced level of um, information sharing will happen. We expect that to happen at that stage. Um, so um, yes, we, we don't expect, um, you know, we don't generally put the uh, more advanced uh, specifics into my scope, but um, yeah. Okay, Has anybody got any other questions? As we are now on one screen, um, if anybody's got anything they'd like to uh, say, they could unmute themselves and put their hand up, that would be fine. And we also, while people are doing, uh, thinking about that, we've also had some very nice positive comments and thanks coming through, which is lovely to hear. Thank you. I'm glad it's been useful for people. Um, any issue? Okay, so uh, Zooming, somebody's had a bit of a problem with the uh, Adam Pro pages was zooming in and out of the page. Um, I'm not quite sure. Uh, Asan, do you want to tell me a bit more about that problem? Oh, maybe they've gone. Um, well, uh, oh, they've thank gone. you. Uh, this is a great website to start uh, learning the microscopy. Uh, and yeah, uh, uh, when I was doing this uh, module, mm -hmm. uh, when you press the next button or the previous button, you go ahead with the pages. And sometimes I saw that this next button is uh, falling out of the page and you can't find it. And it's really difficult to zoom out of the page and get that. Is that on the theory or on the simulator? Uh, just before the simulator, just uh, in I the general pages. I think you should be able to scroll down um, generally. Um, yeah. Scroll down the page. I found this, that this has caught me before. Not, I have a solution. Generally, it's great, but uh, just small mm -hmm. bits and pieces that can be modified, really. Yeah. Oh, it's okay. always good to be. We certainly yeah. try to um, respond to people's uh, issues where possible with the simulator itself. There is now a nice little animation on the front. If if your if the simulator protrudes beyond the bottom of your page, if you push in the right hand side of the browser window, that will raise up the actual simulator um, window itself. So um, that's something that we've put this little animation in there now because people were having a bit of problem um, with yeah. that. Um, I, really think I, I think I have a solution for Eason though, Jenny. Yep. Ah, yes. Yep. Sometimes on some browsers, when yep. you scroll up and down with the little roller wheel on your mouse, you have to have the cursor actually over the text box. Otherwise, oh, okay. you can't scroll down. So if you try that, you will be able to scroll down. Yeah. <laughs> a guarantee. A bit of IT issues. <laughs> yeah, Thank correct, you. correct. Yes. Yeah. But yes, we'll, we'll certainly talk to the web developer, but if you could jump on and test if you can scroll up and down with your wheel on your mouse, yeah. while hovering your mouse over the window, uh -huh. over the text, I think you'll be thumbs up. Excellent. Uh, mm -hmm. That sounds like some good advice. I hope that works for you. Yeah. It's working. Okay. Excellent. Yeah. Thank you. And great. Problem solved. That's what we like. Yeah. Um, right. So, does anybody have uh, any other questions? Because we're now at um, eight thirty-one. So, uh, last chance to jump in with a question. Otherwise, I will thank you all very much uh, for attending, and we hope um, that you. Uh, had a, an interesting session and we'll be able to jump on and check out the theory and the simulators and um, use it in your training. So again, thank you very much for coming.